Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to this this webinar on YouTube. First time um, we have Rodney with us. Hello, Rodney. And Rodney will be covering Xamarin uh, Maui, so all of the upcoming um, desktop and mobile stuff that is happening in .NET worlds, and uh, also talk a little bit about reactive MVVM. But I'm gonna let him introduce the topic because he's uh, he's probably way more proficient at that than uh, than I am. Uh, before we start. Um, in case you've never attended a YouTube webinar, um, which if you've been been watching us on GoToWebinar before, that's uh, probably the case. Uh, there's a live chat and you can use it to ask questions. We will try to answer as we go along. Uh, very often that's something that uh, Robert and, and myself can answer. But if there's a question for Rodney, uh, don't hold back, ask your questions and we'll, uh, we'll ask the questions to Rodney later on during the webinar. Uh, the webinar is also going to be recorded. Uh, and typically, the recording is going to be available uh, in a few days on our blog. We'll post resources, we'll post uh, whatever Rodney wants to share with you. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we are ready to go and we'll give the stage to Rodney. There you go. All right, Martin, thank you very much. Uh, I want to go ahead and start off by thanking JetBrains for the opportunity to uh, to come in and, and speak about Xamarin. Um, I've been consuming JetBrains products for many years now, um, so it's, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to give back. Um, so today uh, we're talking about like uh, Xamarin, Maui, and the reactive MVVM between them. Um, Xamarin is kind of preparing for this trip towards Maui. Uh, we make this joke because Maui is an actual destination. So, you know, we're getting ready for vacation. Um, Xamarin as a technology is uh, getting rolled into the core framework in the 6.0 release. Um, and this is a big deal. This third party technology has found its way into the to the core.NET framework. Um, and it's and it's a big piece of the core.NET framework because it, it helps C sharp target iOS, Android, and many other operating systems that, that, that .NET can now run on as a result of the .NET Core transition. Uh, so today we're gonna kind of take a trip through where Xamarin kind of started, um, how it fits into the, to the, to the .NET framework, kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of how to get started and, and what tools you would need, um, and, and then kind of wrap it up at the end to kind of give you an understanding of how uh, Xamarin is, is doing things. So uh, I'm Rodney. Um, I'm a Xamarin developer by day. So I actually uh, write and, and deliver cross-platform applications on the technology. Uh, I help maintain Reactive UI, which is an open source MVVM framework. Um, I consume open source software uh, on, a, on a very large scale. And uh, I like functional programming. So you can find me on Twitter. I stream on Twitch uh, once a week. Uh, reactive concepts in the in the C sharp space. I blog on occasion and you can always find me in the React UI Slack. So if you, after this talk you have questions about uh, Xamarin, MVVM or Reactive UI, uh, feel free to jump in and ask out. Um, this weekend, uh, we are getting ready for our first Reactive UI virtual conference. Um, so I'm just gonna take a quick moment and, and do a little bit of marketing. And if you hear anything here today that kind of piques your interest, I would I would urge you to go sign up for the conference. Uh, maintainers and consumers alike will be uh, giving presentations about how to get more value out of a reactive approach to, uh, to managing your code. So, uh, again, just a, a quick recap. You know, our journey begins with uh, with a rundown of what is cross-platform technology. Um, what problems do they solve? Um, patterns for building an application with Xamarin.net. Um, kind of a, a better approach to architecting software, and then some of the newer concepts that are that are creeping into .NET and things that are are are. Um, going to be there once once .NET fully integrates Xamarin into its into its core framework. So the problem statement, right? Um, technologies generally emerge to solve problems. So cross-platform technologies address a few concerns that developers face. Um, those um, so we get into the conversation of like cross-platform or native, and I have had this conversation a lot. Um, in my time. So, you know, what is cross-platform? What is native? What's, what's you know, a progressive web app versus, a, you know, a Xamarin app versus uh, Apache Cordova app? 
native really just means that you are native to the operating system that you're working against and you have access to the native APIs. So like from a purist perspective, you could say that a native application is only something that's written in Swift, written in Kotlin, written in Objective-C or written in Java. But in reality, it's native as long as it has access to the native platform APIs. And the cross-platform technologies solve this problem by giving you access to the native APIs on the operating system um, and use of those native controls. So cross-platform technology in the .NET space um, has been a very interesting road. Uh, .NET Core 3 is out, .NET 5 is on its way uh, at the end of this year, and we are using tools like Roslyn, Mono, and .NET Core to target multiple frameworks, multiple operating systems, um, and, and allowing .NET code to now run on pretty much anywhere where, where, there's a, where there is an operating system that's, that's, that's of note. Uh, the platforms that we, can, that we can target are iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows, uh, and web. So we, we really have a, a mono and the, and, and the .NET core cross-platform uh, movement have really changed the face of where C Sharp can execute. And anywhere C Sharp can execute, we, we can run a, a, a .NET application. So again, platforms. I want to target iOS. I want to target Android. I want to, I want to target uh, desktop. Um, but the question then becomes, do I really need a native application? And then if I need a app native application, what technology should I use? Do I want to have separate code bases to write the same application? Um, do I want to write, write the same application multiple times? You know, uh, if I'm if I'm writing it in Objective C or if I'm writing it in Kotlin, that's two separate code bases, two separate sets of bugs, two separate sets of skills that you have to have in order to be able to ship one set of business value. And the the platform question really becomes a question of reach. It becomes a question of where do I expect my users to interact with the code that I'm writing? Um, do I expect them only to ever use it on iOS? Uh, the market would tell you that that's probably a bad assumption. So this cross-platform technology and the platform decision um, lets us determine where we're actually going to reach our end users and how we're going to be able to deliver value. But these questions also have some other implications. So again, staffing, right? So if I have to staff up, I have to go to the, and, uh, and I wanna build a Android native in Kotlin or an iOS native in Swift, I have to have Kotlin and Swift skill sets on my team. So now we're looking at two completely separate code structures that are going to have to produce the same output. Um, I, you know, we've probably all been writing code long enough to know that the reality of that is there's always going to be bugs. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be one thing that one application does that the other one doesn't because we've had to solve for something in some uh, weird way for some platform specific reason. But when you go cross platform, you don't have those problems. You can use C sharp and target both operating systems. And then you can use tools like XAML because XAML is something that a lot of WPF uh, and Silverlight developers know. So you can get a, a, a resource that understands XAML and, and kind of give them a, a ramp up period into the, into the mobile aspect of things. You can also write your UI in C Sharp. So your, your C Sharp skills transfer across the entirety of your application. So oftentimes we as developers and myself included, we get so caught up in the code has to be right, the code has to be pristine, and we forget about we are here to deliver customer value. We're here to ship software, right? And a single application is easier to get to market on multiple platforms. It's easier to maintain because it's a single code base, a single repository. And because we have access to all the platform APIs, we can do anything that a, that a quote unquote native application can do. The only difference is we write it once and they have to write it twice. So now that's two network stacks that you have to deal with and, and, and you may get network request issues on one that you don't get on the other and then you have to fix that. And all of those things that you have to deal with with disparate code bases arise. But when we write it once, we can deliver customer value 
cheaper, faster, and better. In comes Xamarin. Uh, Xamarin is a, is a .NET approach to solve the cross-platform problem. Uh, Xamarin uh, is built on the Mono technology um, and is the natural evolution of Mono Touch and Mono Droid, which were originally the the oh god probably about eight ten years ago was the was the way you did cross platform was you actually had Mono Touch and Mono Droid and there was very little code reuse. Um, there was very little of the current Xamarin feel that you get today where you're really writing a single application. Uh, you know, back then, Mono Touch and Mono Droid, you were still writing two separate applications for the most part, um, but you were at least able to write it in C Sharp. But what Xamarin provides is a C Sharp interop layer on top of Objective-C and Java that allows you access to the platform APIs. So you, I keep talking about these platform APIs because it's important, but uh, you know, things like the file system, network access, UI, those are all different depending upon what operating system you're on. Uh, .NET Core has solved a lot of those concerns for desktop, right? So now you can run um, applications on Mac, Windows, or Linux, and file system access is abstracted away. So there, there, are, there are ways that Xamarin allows you to get access to the things that you need in order to interact with the operating system to create a full featured application. So the traditional Xamarin approach is basically you have your your iOS, your your Android, in your in your in your Windows targets. Uh, you have some shared C sharp backend that that is where you can comprise your your business logic and get the majority of your shared work. Uh, but in the traditional Xamarin model, you were getting probably about seventy percent code reuse. Uh, you still had to code the UI on each platform. Um, but what it does allow you to do is use platform specific uh, interfaces. So you can write your, your, your UI using interface builder um, uh, or storyboards for iOS. You can use uh, AXML for Android, or you can use C Sharp for Windows. And you can still kind of do things that really close to the metal of the platform. Um, but taking this approach, you weren't getting as much code reuse. So again, 70% code reuse is great, but Xamarin decided that, you know, it, this is wonderful that we've got this way to deliver these native apps, but maybe we can get more value. Maybe we can make it easier um, to, 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 to ship a single, uh, single application. So the traditional Xamarin approach kind of went by the wayside and in comes Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms um, kind of alleviated the, uh, the, the need to create a user interface specific to the platform. Um, now you'll see in the Xamarin Forms approach, I can create a shared UI across my iOS, Android, and Windows targets, and any other targets um, that 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 support the same UI kits. Um, and now I'm not only sharing my, my business logic, but I'm sharing my UI. So my UI gets created once, gets rendered out for the various platforms, and I have more code reuse. And now the only thing that I really have to deal with are the thin layers, the thin things that I want to deal with. Uh, again, platform specifics like location services or uh, push notifications. Those are those are those are the only real things that a Xamarin Forms developer has to deal with. Um, I find myself now that I'm dealing more in the Xamarin Forms space, I find myself going less and less to the platform to do things. And I find myself staying in the in the in the shared C sharp layer a lot more, which means that now I'm able to write more code in the shared layer, share more code across all of my applications and reduce any platform specific UI bugs or, or, you know, uh, usability bugs that would come from me having to step down into the platform layer. There is still the ability to get into the platform layer and project back out into Xamarin Forms. That's a little bit more uh, advanced of a topic, uh, but it, it is possible for you to, 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 to write a custom view in the platform you want and then push it up to the Forms layer. So now we're actually going to be writing a single application in a single code base and creating separate binaries for each platform that we want to target. So this is a huge step in the right direction, right? I'm, I'm no longer having to um, spend a three week downtime to get Android up to snuff with iOS because you know we, we've got 
minimal resources and and we and we don't have a way to to, to move forward with with the resources we have so we've got to do ios first and android now i can write my ui and it will work 90 percent across across platforms and then i'll just have to tweak certain things on certain platforms so now i'm actually able to get to market faster which means i can deliver customer value quicker and i can get feedback from my customers which in the mobile space is very important um, the app store is very unforgiving and if you push an app to the app store, one bad rating could 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 literally spoil the entire uh, the entire application. So the ability to get customer feedback, iterate over that customer feedback, and push changes to your mobile application are very important. So we're starting to see why this cross-platform technology has really started to emerge because it's solving a very real concern that developers face. How do I how do I as the developer satisfy my business requirements and get value to the business as quick as possible so that they can get value. <clears throat> so you can create consistent or platform specific UI look and feel in a single project. So uh, this is this is taken from a, a sample from one of the, the Xamarin Forms repos. Um, this, this is basically just a, a Android screen that kind of shows you that you can create a native Android look. Uh, you can create your app to be cross-platform in the sense where your UI looks consistent to your to your business design, or you can make it so that your application looks and feels like a native application and is just styled for your business. So you've got op opportunities and options there. Uh, Xamarin doesn't really force any opinions on you in that way. Um, it, it provides uh, platform renderers, which give you the ability to look at any given element as it's being rendered and affect its rendering. Um, and there are a few options and approaches that you can use uh, to build Xamarin interfaces. And the APIs are consistent across either approach you consume. So it really becomes a matter of, I, I it really becomes a matter of, uh, the consistency of what your team structure is. If Z XAML is a skill set that your team has, then XAML is probably a better option. Um, if C Sharp is is more in line with the skill set that you have, C Sharp is probably a better option. There's no clear, decisive reason to go XAML or C Sharp. Uh, so really, it becomes again a question of what what are my skill sets um, and what is the best for the team that that we're that we're on. Um, but we'll talk about a little bit more about some of those things uh, as we go along. So XAML. XAML is a declarative markup language. Um, I personally had no idea what XAML was before uh, Xamarin Forms was introduced. Um, I was not a WPF or Silverlight developer before Xamarin. Um, so XAML UI was actually introduced in Xamarin Forms. So you have the ability to do XAML UI um, in forms, but not at the platform layer. Uh, it, XAML markup allows you to, uh, to feel comfortable um, creating markup style user interfaces for many .NET developers. It provides a clear separation of UI presentation. So one of the main things we talk about from a, from a solid principles perspective in a, in a single responsibility is I, I don't want uh, business logic in my user interface. And XAML actually does, it, XAML actually is the clear winner there uh, in that the markup is your UI presentation. So there's very little opportunity for you to inject C sharp directly into your XAML and, and, and force logic concerns there is a share or there is a uh, a .cs file behind the scenes but that just gives you access to all, and it gives you access to everything that's on the xaml and you can potentially mess up your uh your responsibilities there but overall xaml is a good way to provide markup um for developers to create user interfaces uh that can that can be used cross-platform uh, one of the major sales that I heard about XAML when I first started using XAML was that uh, you know designers can write XAML, um, and I'll say that I've not seen a a designer yet that writes XAML, um, and I've also not seen a tool that takes Sketch or Adobe files and converts them into XAML. So um, there's an opportunity there for for somebody to step in and and make the uh, the conversion from design to implementation uh, a little bit cleaner. So here I've got a little bit of XAML. 
Um, it's uh, basically just a simple page in Xamarin Forms. Um, there's some pre-canned controls. So anytime you're dealing with a, a .NET UI toolkit, there's going to be a, a control-based concept uh, very similar to you know web controls or, or any other type of controls that you may have used from Microsoft in the past. Um, I will point out that the Xamarin XAML is not consistent with the WPF or the UWP XAML. Um, there is actually a effort right now to try and standardize the XAML. But here we have um, you know just a simple search bar, a uh, collection view, which is just a multi-dimensional list. Um, we have a, a single point list in a list view. Uh, we've got some button on the page and some activity indicator. So as you can see from a from a readability perspective, this is pretty readable, right? It's it's just markup. It's it's very similar to XML. It's very similar to HTML. We as developers have seen this before in our life cycle. So getting behind this is is a and, and creating a UI is is easy easier uh, for a lot of developers to to consume. Um, it it allows for a, a clear visual indication of where one element begins and one element ends, which I know is a, uh, a concern in the current C sharp uh, way of, of, of writing UI. Uh, but you know, this is also very, very verbose and, and you know, the verbosity can't really be helped because there's so many different um, extension points that Xamarin gives you uh, to interact with any given control that it becomes uh, somewhat cumbersome. But there are also tools to, uh, to to work with that. So a closer look at our XAML will show that we have you know this uh, this list view here. Um, it's it's on a grid row. It's got a name, so we can get an actual name, so we can deal with it in our C sharp code behind. Um, we're setting some some properties uh, via attributes. We are giving the list view an item template, which in Xamarin Forms uh, indicates that this is the template that you're going to use to render a list. So from a web perspective, if you had like a, and I'm gonna butcher this because I'm not a web guy, but if you had like a UI and UL and you were trying to generate some, some drop-down list um, element, this would be the, 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 the template that you would use, the, the grid or the, or the styling that you would use uh, for that item. Um, so yeah, so there's the, the the data template is just going to be a store card, which is some pre-built template that I can write elsewhere. So now we're seeing that we can still further separate our UI concerns and potentially write reusable controls. Um, we've got a button, which is just a button, and you'll notice that it doesn't have any uh, any colors on it because I'm using styles, which are built into Xamarin Forms views. Any view can have a style, and I'm and I'm creating a style in a in a static resource, which is conveniently off screen. Um, and I am applying that style to my button. So now I can create reusable styles and UI visualizations and apply them to, to the elements that need them um, in a very succinct manner. So if I like, let's say that the designers come back and say, hey, we've got this button and all primary buttons need to be, uh, you know, blue with gold trim. Uh, now I can write a primary button style and make sure that every button that has the primary button style will look and act, or will at least look, maybe not act, but look the same way. Um, this is a this is a very helpful tool to reduce the amount of XAML that you end up writing, because um, again, verbosity is a thing, and we as developers read more code than we actually write, so the readability of this code is very important. And the last thing we have at the bottom is an activity indicator. That activity indicator is uh, is fashioning some XAML bindings. So React, or I'm sorry, uh, Xamarin Forms has a binding engine that allows uh, properties to be bound back and forth between view models, which we'll get into in a second. But you can see here that I have a, a property on my social queue.store search view model, and I am setting the 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 binding to the is loading property of that view model. And I'm setting that to the is running on the activity indicator, which will be an indication to my view or my view that when my view model state has changed, that it should go ahead and update. Um, so it'll this this is loading property in my view model is now uh, dictating how my view should actually run. 
So you can use C-sharp UI uh, as well. Uh, traditional Xamarin or Xamarin forms, can, you can use C-sharp UI. Um, there are pros and cons to this approach as I've, I've kind of stated earlier. Um, the main one is separating view, lo view logic from business logic. As you saw in our previous slide, the XAML is more or less just presentation. It's markup, right? It, you can't really put a lot of business logic in there. Uh, but if you write it all in C-sharp, it becomes very easy for you to blur the lines between where the user interface begins and where the business logic ends. Uh, so I find that when you're writing C-sharp UI, you have to be much more diligent. Uh, but there are some new tools that have come out from Xamarin or uh, that are in Xamarin now, uh, C sharp uh, extensions from or C sharp markup extensions, uh, as well as uh, the the new Comet project, which are kind of changing the way C sharp UIs are built. So this uh, I won't actually show the traditional way of building C sharp UIs because I, I personally think that it's it's going to uh, it's going to be gone in the next three years, but this this code sample is taken from uh, James Clancy's Comet project. And I just wanna point out that this is actually MVU and not MVVM, um, but you can achieve the same pattern using C-sharp markup extensions. So here, this is basically just a page, uh, which is a view, so a view is a page. Um, we have some stateful widget called a Comet um, and, and, some, and uh, you know, this view body method that is return our body. And then underneath you can see that we just have a, a state object called comet that gives us uh, uh, the ability to notify state changes and uh, absorb state changes. So a closer look at this body tag will, uh, will reveal a lot about the, the, the concepts that are here. So the body tag itself is a method. Um, I, I kind of want to point out that it's a method that is returning a new V stack. So that means that every time that this method is called, it is going to return a new instance, um, which means that our user interface is now fully immutable. Um, and we'll get into immutability and immutability in a minute, but this is a very important thing. Um, this is actually very similar to a technology called Flutter uh, and also what Swift UI is doing these days. And I'm not sure if Kotlin is doing it, but I'm pretty sure Kotlin is, is using a similar uh, approach, if not for the UI, but definitely for the, for the state changes. Um, but we're also newing up our individual con or controls on the on the view itself so again our, our ui is fully immutable um, but you'll notice here that in this new button we're actually taking in that stateful widget in the action so because that thing has state and because that state is bound to the screen and it exists outside the context of this newt up v stack i can maintain the state of this object and make sure that it's available for my action on screen um, so this is a, a very interesting way uh, to, to architect applications, uh, and, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit more later. But the, the interesting and, and I think the cleanest part about it for me is you'll notice the fluent builder pattern for identifying where the frame goes, where the margin goes, where the color goes. Um, in the XAML that we saw earlier, all of this would be attributes that you would have to have, and you could, you could lay it out functionally very similar, um, and and put each uh, operator on on a single line for readability, um, but this is very familiar for C sharp developers. A lot of uh, popular libraries that we consume these days are moving more towards fluent patterns uh, for the way that they architect their code. So this is a, a very interesting approach uh, because it provides a you know just a simple fluent builder pattern over creating a new object every time. And the screen will repaint every time that that, uh, that state changes. So that's great. Rodney, you told me that there's like access to these native APIs and uh, you know, I write real world applications and you know, real world applications need access to things like location services so that they can tell where they are in the geospace. Uh, battery life so that they know to reduce the geo service location consumption when the battery is low. Um, we need information about the screen that we're on so that we can resize our, our, our user interface according to the screen that we're on. You know, for Android, the screen sharding is really, really uh, massive in this, in the space. So these, these native APIs that we, that, 
you know, we keep alluding to are very important and they are kind of one of the biggest things about time to market on applications because a lot of these things prov or a lot of these cross-platform technologies provide you uh, ways to get to it. And some of it is really not that, that straightforward or easy. Uh, so getting access to the native API could even be a, you know, an exercise or a coding exercise in and of itself. But Xamarin provides us a library called Xamarin Essentials. Um, Xamarin Essentials is a, are platform specific APIs uh, that are wrapped in an abstraction that are then passed back to the .NET layer for you to interact with. So at their roots, they are basically just abstractions on the platform implementations that you can call from, from your shared c -sharp code. Um, this is actually provided to you by Xamarin now. Xamarin actually, uh, I believe, owns and operates Xamarin Essentials. At one time, this was a, a community-led thing, and it is part of the default template for a new Xamarin application. So now we're seeing a, a very big push to understand that it's not enough to just have these tools um, and, and say that we can target cross-platform, but we've really got to make it easier for developers to interact with this framework uh, to get work done. And Xamarin Essentials allows you to do that. Uh, it, it provides all of the all of the things that you see on the screen and more. Um, there's about a good 30 plus APIs the last I looked, and it's growing every release. So um, anything that you want to be able to do at the platform level uh, that that isn't provided already by Xamarin Essentials, it's a simple GitHub issue, and and most likely will will be addressed uh, relatively quickly. Those guys are, are really pretty much on it, and the community has still been uh, contributing massively to this. So I would be re remiss if I did not talk about navigation. It's one of the things that I probably spend the majority of my time talking about when I talk to new Xamarin developers. Um, and Z Xamarin navigation, uh, it provides an abstraction on the platform navigation, and it's just really a stack at the end of the day, right? So it's just an abstraction on top of a stack. Um, Xamarin provides two stacks for navigation. It provides a modal stack and a page stack, and it all respects just basic stack syntax. Um, and I know that there is a lot of confusion around navigation um, in, in the Xamarin space, which is why they are starting to move towards a, a technology called Xamarin Shell. But at the end of all of it, it's really just a stack. Push, pop, top, peak. I mean, it's, it's more or less standard stack syntax. And they also provide you some events that you can tie into when, uh, when elements are added and or removed from the visual tree. Platform renderers allow you to go to the platform and change how controls are rendered on that platform. So here's a, you know, this is an image taken directly from the docs, uh, but it shows that we can customize a map pin. And in order to do this, you have to go to the platform, create a renderer for that map pin uh, so that you can render out how it works on the platform because the map is a platform specific API. So the only way to really deal with the maps is to deal with it at the at the native layer. Uh, so platform renderers allow us to do that. Um, the other you know reasons why you would use platform renders, again, maps is a very simple example, but anytime that you are tasked with creating a custom user control where forms doesn't provide an extension point for what you're trying to do uh, is when you would want to go use a platform renderer. Uh, I will say that over the past year or so, I find myself writing less and less renderers, which means Xamarin is becoming more and more robust in its ability to handle platform specifics at the shared layer. Another option for user interface creation is Skia uh, and Skia Sharp. Um, of course, that image doesn't didn't scale well, but um, <laughs> I, I promise you, it looks really pretty on the internet when you go look at it. Um, Skia, Skia is a two D graphics engine, and Skia Sharp is built on top of the two D graphics engine um, and provided to you in the .dot net in the in the .dot layer. Um, you can use Skia to draw on the on the actual screen. So now instead of using pre-canned controls and trying to align them on the screen, you can use Skia to actually draw your elements on the screen. So you can draw buttons and text and and images and and animations and all manner of of really awesome UI UX concerns can be done with uh, with with Skia. Um, 
it's very good if you know if you've got a very intensive uh, animation heavy design. Ski is going to be one is going to be something you're going to want to look at. Um, if you have any desire to watch somebody work with Skia, I would recommend uh, watching Kim Philpotts out of Australia. He streams, uh, I think, Fridays, and it's Friday morning, my time, but um, he's amazing with Skia. I've seen him take, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the popular uh, site Dribble um, that has UI and UX, but he will go on there and take um, user experiences that are not actually meant to be implemented just to you know show off the designer skills and he'll use skia and go render those user interfaces um, and get the animations and all sorts of amazing stuff uh, so skia is a really good uh include to uh any xamarin application if you really need to get a, a more of a consumer driven application and and target uh kind of the app store um, Ski is going to be a, a really, a really good app value add for you. Uh, Xamarin has uh, Blazor mobile bindings, so you can actually use the power of Blazor, which is uh, Microsoft's new web framework. Um, you can use the power of Blazor with Xamarin. Um, this is a very good way for anybody that is familiar with Blazor or familiar with web to kind of get their feet wet in Xamarin. It, it, um, it kind of bridges that gap between the web world and, and the Xamarin world. Uh, and I'll also point out that Xamarin does support C sharp or C sharp CSS. So you can, you can use CSS um, to style your, your, your Xamarin user interface with your Blazor mobile bindings. There's a uh, data binding. So Xamarin forms uh, has built in data binding. Um, it's all based on the I notify property changed event. And I'm gonna take a moment to point out something very important. I notify property changed is an event. It is a regular plain .NET event that has a plain event handler behind the scenes. That's gonna be really important in a minute. So data binding allows us to separate our user interface from our business logic and it kind of bridges the user interactions. So as the user is making updates to the screen, the binding engine is passing those changes to my uh, my, my separate concern. Uh, in this case, it's a view model. Um, it's having a two-way communication uh, between the UI and what the user is doing and the view model where my, where my business logic uh, kind of resides. So now we can separate our, our user interface and, and we can encapsulate the what happens when the user does blank answers. So when the user taps this button, what happens? When the user clicks on this field, what happens? We can kind of start to separate the 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 actual state mutation from the the actual UI concern. And, and that becomes very important when you're trying to build scalable, maintainable applications in the .NET space. So Xamarin gives you everything you need to build cross-platform applications that look and feel native, that perform at, at native uh, at, at, at native performance metrics. They provide effects that allow you to override individual view elements as they're rendered, um, value converters, so you can convert values, um, complex values in your XAML, uh, but using some convert function. Data triggers uh, allow you to make changes to the UI based on state changes elsewhere. Um, behaviors allow you to attach changes to the default behavior of a view element. So, you know, maybe this element only takes numbers and you could write a behavior that will force it to only take numbers. Um, and platform renderers allow you to dictate how an entirety of a view is, is rendered. So effects kind of let you tap into a single view element, whereas renderers will say, hey, anything that extends from this type will get this, this, this rendering. Um, so it, it, it gives you a lot of ways to, to interact and to build your, 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 your application. It doesn't force any opinions on you and it gives you a lot of tools. But I mean, how do I build an app, right? Because you know, it's great to write code and it's, and it's great to have all of these tools available to me. And we've seen a lot of these tools, but you know, how do I, how do I, how do I enforce good practices? And I explicitly put good practices here uh, because I have this vendetta against the word best practices. Best practices is very subjective. And if you've been in this 
game long enough, you know that the, the, the only right answer to a question in the tech space is it depends. Um, and a, a colleague of mine always talks about there, there are, there are trade-offs that have to be made. So, you know, good practices is, is less about the dogma of these best practices that we hear from these gurus and more about how do I do good things when I can and avoid bad things when I should. Uh, you know, solid is more or less self-explanatory. You know, again, we want to separate our UI concerns from our business logic. We want to, you know, set up dependency inversion um, and design patterns, right? We're talking about like just good old fashioned gang of foreign design patterns. You know, when should I use this pattern? How can I use these patterns to uh, create a more maintainable, scalable application? And in the .NET space, the answer currently is, uh, is MVVM. So it's it's funny that I that I put this slide up here because I actually maintain a different framework other than Prism, uh, but the Prism guys are are friends of mine, so I, I don't mind giving them some some play. Um, MVVM is is such an important concept to to .NET native development that Miguel Diacaza said on stage at a Xamarin keynote that you should use Prism. Um, Prism is a is a MVVM framework that started at Microsoft based on patterns and practices. Uh, there are a couple of options available for you in the .NET space. Major players are Prism, Reactive UI, MVVM Cross, Fresh MVVM, and there's a, there's a couple of others. Um, regardless of which MVVM framework you choose, what Miguel was trying to get across is there is very little business or return on business value when you go and write your own custom MVVM framework. So pick a framework use a framework, stand on the backs of giants and, and don't get caught up in the bottleneck of having to write everything yourself, right? Use open source, use tools that are available, use tools that will help uh, get you closer to delivering customer value and less time spinning the wheels, uh, just playing around with code. So MVVM. Uh, stands for model view view model. So again, it's it's kind of poorly named because you'll see here that those things don't go in that order. But you know, marketing is hard and naming things is hard. So um, what you have is uh, basically a presentation business logic and presentation logic. So your view can be written in XAML or C sharp. Um, you can use uh, whatever you want really from in, in the model so any manner of nuget packages or you know internal concepts to encapsulate your application logic and make your application work um, and then your presentation logic is basically the bridge between um, your your view model and how your view interacts and i explicitly put it closer to the view because it doesn't really exist in the view model because the view model isn't solely presentation logic so Knowledge is a, is a concept of access. Um, the view has access to the view model and the view model has access to the model, but it is a single direction uh, relationship. It is not bi-directional. So one of the core tenets of MVVM and that separation of concerns is that the view should have knowledge of the view model, but the view model should not have direct knowledge of the view. Um, and how we accomplish this is through data binding. Uh, data binding uh, allows us to, to respond to property change events and communicate those events uh, downstream to our to our business logic uh, and then get return values and, and, and do some additional work. So MVVM helps us achieve a separation of concerns. Our UI code is separated from our business logic. Our business logic uh, can you know, use dependency inversion and other good software principles and, and be completely and totally segregated from, from our user interface. Um, by doing this, we can achieve some level of testability. View models can now depend on abstractions. Uh, view model state is now testable using any unit testing framework. Uh, and we achieve portability. We can now reuse our view models um, across multiple platform targets. Uh, so, you know, talking about Xamarin, generally what we talk about is uh, iOS and Android. But, you know, when we get to the future of .NET, we're going to be able to target iOS, Android, and anything under the sun. So the reuse promise that these view models give uh, is a very good promise because now we can reduce again the amount of code that we have to rewrite for a specific platform. And uh, MVVM uses uh, events. So UI elements emit events that can be handled by observers. Um, a lot of 
UI kits are providing an I command interface when they have a command that they can execute for you. So they provide you a binding to bind a command to the view element. Um, and then it has bindings, which are, again, that two-way communication that allows access um, to the view model without giving direct knowledge to the view model of the view's concerns. So now we talk about mutable state. Um, and uh, mutable state is really just a stream of events from the user. So like a button tap, uh, text typed, it's a stream of events from the operating system. Uh, my network connectivity is lower than it was, so I need to throttle back. Uh, my battery is low, my location changed. And state changes as a result of these stream of events. So I, you know, the, the, the graphic is, is, is kind of a joke, but I mean, that's really what it is, right? Like we're, we've got this, this flowing stream of information that we can tap into. Um, and that is our state mutation, right? You know, the, the, the user types in something into the entry box, the user clicks a button. All of these things are state changes that we can respond to using MVVM. But I'm a functional guy, and uh, I understand that mutable state is uh, is the enemy, right? So uh, there's this paper that was written some years ago called Out of the Tar Pit. And what they talked about, or the, the, the main premise or argument was, or proposed, was that the biggest source of complexity in our programs is mutable state. Managing all the combinations of state is just not a feasible thing. So global state management is hard, right? having a central place to manage that state is not a, an ideal thing to do. So um, they, they further went on to apply object-oriented approaches of single responsibility to functional programming and realized that they could get value out of a lot of small functions that, that are immutable and they just act in result to state changes. So like, what does that actually mean, right? Like mutable state and, you know, single responsibility, like what are we really talking about? So here I've got a code sample from uh, from a sample app that I that I'm writing, um, and it just calls a DuckDuckGo API, gets some search information, and returns some values. Um, one of the things I'll the uh, first thing that I'll point out here is that you'll notice that there's a, a try, catch, and a finally. I generally do not like to do this when I'm calling a command because I feel like the exception should just bubble all the way up. But I, I had to do this here to point out a very important concern. That when I, the developer, have to manage the state, right? I have to check to see if it's processing when we enter the method. And then if it isn't processing, I go ahead and set it to processing and then I go ahead and execute my search. Well, now my state mutation is going to be smathered across my entire view model. In order to know what the current state of this is processing is, I have to know everywhere where it's set. Now with modern tooling like, you know, Rider and ReSharper, you can, you can get some value out of those tools and reduce the cognitive load, but you still are tasked with making sure that this state is correct at any given point. So we see here that if it's if it's already processing, this won't even run, it'll return default. And we now have to have the expectation that our consumers will deal with the billion dollar mistake versus us being able to deal with it for them. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going into the finally block after everything is, is done and, and setting that processing value to false as a fail safe. So imagine I have five, 10, 20 commands in a view model, and I have to set the state across all of these. And there's a bug that says, hey, this spinner is spinning when it shouldn't be. That's 20 places that I have to check uh, in order to just get that to work. So how can we mitigate that? Um, you know, enter reactive extensions. Um, in the .NET space, I like to call reactive extensions linked to events. But um, really what it allows us to do, or what reactive extensions is as a high level, is a language agnostic specification for how to implement the observer pattern. At a lower level in the .NET space, it's an API for asynchronous programming with observable streams. So .NET reactive um, 
gives you a consistent API to apply link operators over events and asynchronous methods. So imagine being able to respond to an event from the user, merge it with a task that the user is running in response to that event, and then some other command being executed and not being able to execute because that task hasn't returned. Um, Reactive Extension provides a very consistent API for being able to do that. Um, so explicitly, uh, the, the languages of asynchrony is important because in the .NET space, uh, asynchrony is defined as async and await for most developers, but you can actually use observables uh, to model asynchronous programming. I won't say similar to the way async and await does, but as an alternative to the way async and await does. And you can process all that in like a single pipeline and apply functional operators over it. So Reactive UI is an MVVM framework built on top of Reactive Extensions. Reactive UI at its core is just a set of functions that make using functional programming to manage mutable state easier when building a .NET application. Um, I'm starting to look at RX view models as uh, as kind of custom state machines where they have transitions that happen, you arrive at new states, and then when you arrive in the state, some function gets executed. So now what I'm actually doing is creating with the with the reactive MVVM approach, I've got my my view, my view model, and my model the same as I did before, but now my my presentation is just my view, and I now start to look at the mental model of my view model being my mutable state, right? It is the state machine that is custom built for this presentation layer. And it knows how and when to do all the appropriate things to interact with my state behind the scenes, right? So now we're shifting our mental model to look at these things as presentation, mutable state and state. So events get fired in from the view. The view model has the opportunity to then mutate itself based upon that event. The view model can then fire a command that allows you to access application state and affect application state. The, the application state will then emit its new state, right? I save the HTTP request and the data is 200. Um, I hit a 404, whatever the state of the application behind the scenes is, I can now pass that to my mutable state machine and propagate those state changes back up to the view using that binding concept. So now I've kind of, it's, 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 it's all really the same things and this is semantics, but now I've kind of shifted my mental model on how I'm actually approaching state mutation um, and, and how MVVM actually works. So observables can use async and await syntax uh, even though they don't, they aren't async and await, or they can use the syntax. Uh, they're asynchronous by default, which means they they can technically execute on a different thread context. I'm going to point out now that uh, in the .NET world, async and await do not actually guarantee a new thread. So this means that asynchronous does not equal a new thread context. Uh, but in Rx, we can explicitly marshal our pipelines to execute on a given thread context. So if I want to delay uh, the, the user input, I can write my delay such that it runs on the task pool scheduler so that it doesn't block the UI thread. This becomes very important in mobile applications because anytime you block the UI thread, the user can't interact with your application. The user can't interact with your application. They're probably going to delete it off, your, off their phone and find another app that works the way they want it to do. Um, and they're disposable by default. So iObservable by default when it's subscribed to returns an iDisposable. Uh, you can batch these disposals and kind of manage your, your garbage collection in a very clean and consistent way. Um, I'm actually probably gonna skip over the majority of this slide, but I'm gonna talk about it enough to just basically bring up, this is a basic um, response to a text change event in Rx. Um, it allows me to respond to the change, throttle the change, so I'm only getting changes on, a, on, a, on an interval. I can run it on a different scheduler. Um, I can make sure that the, the change is distinct from the last change notification. So now I'm actually paying attention to the previous state that came in. Um, I can marshal it to the main thread scheduler when I'm done, and then I can invoke my actual command. Um, 
And then, as I said, we can dispose with some view binding concept and, and, and get rid of that. But we'll take a look at this in a minute when we get into more of the code samples around how some of this works. So these are .NET events for anyone who's not seen them before. Um, I, I want to, again, appreciate Rider because Rider groups all of these together and made it very easy for me to <laughs> snag this screenshot. This is a, a, a basic Xamarin Forms list view. And as you can see, these are all these are some of the events that Xamarin Forms provides from a given control. So you can see that if Xamarin is providing these events, uh, we can we can change them into observables and create pipelines from these events and get streams of events uh, from our controls. Um, the actual creation of these can be tedious and and, and verbose. So. Um, you know, a couple of, about a year ago, uh, one of the maintainers of Reactive UI came up with this awesome thing called Pharmacist. Pharmacist actually wraps all events in a NuGet package as an observable. It works on every .NET platform, works on the target version of the NuGet that you want, and reduces the whole observable dot from event or observable dot from event pattern syntax that you would have to write. So it changes the previous look to this look where now I have a store list and I can access the list of events and I can get an observable off of that event extension method. So now I can use this library to reduce the amount of boilerplate code that I have to write uh, to interact with these things and, and, and again, start getting more customer value out the door because this is less code that I have to write, less stuff that I have to maintain. So uh, I've been talking for a while now. Um, and that's not normal for me. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and jump into some uh, some code. And let's go ahead and pull this up. So what I have here is a, this is actually um, a sample application that I wrote or that I wrote for a talk that I'm giving in two days. So uh, JetBrains gets, a, you know, a exclusive behind the scenes access at my really awesome, you know, proprietary codes. Um, and for whatever reason, my uh, my coloring is not working, so uh, I'll just kind of let that go. But points that I want to bring up, right? We talked about you know dependency inversion. This should look very familiar to any ASP.NET developer, right? I'm basically using the iService collection to to register my dependencies uh, for consumption, right? So this is the same extension point that you use in ASP.NET Core or in any of the new Microsoft frameworks. Um, it allows, you know, like I said, dependency inversion. So I can I can register my views for navigation. I can register Sarah log. I can register my navigation library. I can register my caching library. And now I get full on dependency inversion in my Xamarin application. So now I can truly live the dream of the of the of the MVVM cell, right? Uh, which is which is maintainability and scalability. Uh, now I can inject things into my view models and. We can see here where I have a view model where this view model is actually taking in its dependencies, which are the uh, the view stack service and the uh, the pop up stack service, right? And the and its data store service. So it can now get these through dependency injection, just like you would in an ASP.NET Core app. So now we as Xamarin developers are kind of bridging that gap towards things that exist in other aspects of the .NET framework, uh, which is a very exciting thing. Um, I'll, I'll pull this up to kind of give a quick thing that I didn't talk about. One of the bigger ads to XAML recently is this concept of control templates and template bindings. Um, I can create reusable controls using a control template and template bindings, um, the specifics of which uh, I, I won't get into. It's actually relatively well documented. Uh, but what this does is this allows me to create a reusable control and bind to any view model. So normally I would have to know what the binding context, what they call the binding context is, what that type is in order to be able to get fidelity. Uh, with control template, I don't have to worry about that. I can just provide the control and then bind to any view model that I want to. Um, and this is again, just a, a, a relatively straightforward grid uh, with some other controls in there, you know, some labels and some other things. And we're gonna spin this up here in a second and, and take it for a spin. Um, but here we kind of get to the meat and potatoes of things. This is where I'm kind of using the value of Rx from an MVVM concern. And I will point out that this is that C sharp code behind file that we talked about earlier. You'll notice it's a partial class. So we can initialize this, com uh, the component. We can do a whole bunch of win any values. And this is all reactive UI specific syntax. And I 
apologize because the, the amount of time that it would take to go in depth on Xamarin, MVVM, and Reactive UI is beyond the scope of this talk, but this will hopefully give you a very clear indication of why you might want to use it. I have got my view setups. Oh, let me go find the, uh, I've got my view setups to, to respond to, hold on. Yeah, I've got my view set up to respond to these. These are actually X named on the XAML, on the XAML in Xamarin. So I can get access to the actual search bar property or the control. And again, I'm using pharmacist here to generate the events. I'm getting the text change event as an observable. I'm throttling it for 250 milliseconds. And then I'm doing some checks to see whether or not um, the values are indicated. So I'm actually using this to determine if the user has typed something in the search box and they no longer want what's in, or they go ahead and delete everything that's in the search box, go ahead and clear out the search. Uh, so what this will do is this will remove all search terms from the, from the view uh, once once this this text change event hits. Um, and this is actually very important because here I'm using the text change event, but when we swap over to the view model, I'll show you that I'm using binding to actually do the search. Uh, so again, there's more events on this list view. So on that same list or on, or on this list view, um, we've got events and item tap. So when an uh, item is tapped on the, on, the, on the control, I want to go and do something. Uh, and I'm gonna invoke this details command, which is gonna give me the detail information for that item. Uh, I can also you know, tie into other events here uh, and subscribe to those events and do other things. A lot of people tell me that they don't like this because they want their entire UI to be built in XAML and they don't like to put anything in this C-sharp layer. I will tell you that you don't have to do it using events. I find that sometimes it's easier to subscribe directly to the Xamarin Forms event on the UI than it is to go through the binding engine, not because of any perceivable performance difference, but more so because it it uh, it becomes a clear separation of concern because as we said earlier, the view model or the view has knowledge of the view model. So here you can see my view is actually reaching into my view model to execute this command. Um, and here we've got our nice, simple uh, reactive view model. And I'll point out that in reactive programming, the majority of the logic goes in the constructor, which is very hard for a lot of people to deal with. So instead of having uh, you know a whole bunch of stuff out here where I'm doing selects and stuff out here on the public property, um, which is syntax that I, I'm starting to see a lot more like you see it here, instead of doing this, I can actually construct all of my objects in my constructor and then allow the state changes to dictate um, what's actually happening. So we'll go ahead and spin this up here real quick. And I've got a, a relatively contrived example here that I'll, I'll kind of talk to. So uh, another feature that I absolutely love about Rider uh, is that being a functional programmer, I can actually put breakpoints at any given point in this, in this functional setup and break and get the context at that point uh, in my debugging session, which is an extreme value add when you're dealing with uh, reactive and asynchronous programming. As you'll see here, uh, let me bring the debug window back up. Rider actually gives me the context of each one of these things. So I'm constructing a when any observable and saying anytime that the search method is, or the search command is executing, or the initialize command is executing, or any one of these commands are executing, go ahead and set the loading to true. Uh, we saw earlier in the presentation where I was where, where I was setting the is progress equal to true or false. Well, this now inverts that. We're now using the solid principle of inversion of control and we're inverting the control flow and allowing the state to dictate or the state of the view model to dictate how this view model is actually gonna operate. So we'll go ahead and run it again and we'll see that um, Ryder is now showing visually that there has been a change from the last value. So this blue is actually indicating that this value has changed from the false value. And then when we go ahead and see that now, you'll see my activity indicator is visible over here in my, in my emulator. Um, this is a, a very powerful way to, to construct uh, MVVM because MVVM is inherently event-based. It, it, it is based on uh, events and commands. Again, I notify property changed is just an event. So again, we'll go ahead and click on something here to get some more stuff. You see again, now my category is, is dinging true. So my category command is executing. 
And now I've got data on my screen. So now I've got data on my screen and I can click on one of these things. And again, because the details is executing, is gonna click. And now I've got a nice little pop-up that tells me that I've got a store named FUD Ruckers. It's got a one hour wait time and I can add it to the queue. Um, so this is kind of a, a less contrived example and this, this code will be public, uh, publicly available after this weekend um, on GitHub. But this is a uh, actual real world app that I built specifically to show uh, MVVM best, better practices. Again, best practices is, is, is kind of a bad, bad, bad decision point. MVVM better practices, uh, how to construct an app with reactive concerns, because the number one thing that I hear from people is uh, reactive is, is, is great and all, but how do I build an application with it? So this, this code sample is specifically designed to show you how you could build an application with it. Uh, and why this is important is because these are streams of events. Earlier in my presentation, I pointed out uh, that other technologies are using streams of events. So Reactive UI gives the same power that you would have in Flutter or Swift UI uh, to Microsoft uh, .NET native applications using MBVM. So getting back to it, the, the, the new hotness that's out there uh, is model view update, right? So this is a new pattern. So if MBVM is a pattern or a, a implementation pattern, then model view update is a different pattern to achieve the same uh, separation of concerns. Um, the, the model uh, renders, the model changes render out to the view. Uh, the notification will go to the, to update the view. And then the update happens to the model and the cycle just continues. So this is actually very in line with your like React JS. Uh, I believe Angular and Vue also have a similar uh, manner and as well as Blazor, right? This is basically what happens when the state changes. Um, we just go ahead and refresh the UI. Um, the important part about this is that now this concept is coming to the .NET framework. So now in the .NET framework, we're actually going to have uh, the access to the MVV MVU pattern. Um, and that's important because declarative UI and MVU are things that other languages already have. Uh, they're based on streams or observables at the heart of them. And when the state mutates, things just kind of happen, right? The, the view repaints, uh, the state changes, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, this is kind of the de facto way to do things in Flutter. Flutter uses uh, Skia Sharp and MVU to draw and render uh, cross-platform applications. And SwiftUI is using a very similar paradigm these days. Uh, and SwiftUI is the, the native iOS um, uh, language. So it's coming to .NET. We're kind of introducing, you know, .NET MAUI. We're, we're finally here. We've made it to, uh, to our destination. Um, MAUI stands for multi-platform app UI. So it's the uh, natural evolution of, of Xamarin Forms. It's a cross-platform native UI, so you can target all the same places where you can target in Xamarin today, uh, plus more is gonna be the cell. So stuff like uh, WinUI, uh, the WPF, I believe are all gonna be more consumable, uh, but we don't know for sure because the, they're targeting the, uh, the preview to release uh, in .NET 6 at the end of this year. So .NET 5 is supposed to come out in the next couple of months. Uh, MAUI will be fully integrated into the .NET Core platform uh, by the end of next year, uh, 2021, I believe. So .NET 6. Um, and this is a very exciting time for .NET developers because this is Microsoft actually responding. You know, you know, lo and behold, Microsoft is actually responding to market feedback, right? Other application suites, other ways to build multiple uh, multi-platform applications are are using this paradigm and Microsoft is is actually taking a page from that book and saying, well, if, if they can do it, we can do it as well. So now they actually are trying to answer the flutters in the in the Swift UIs and the Kotlins of the world by providing a similar experience on the .NET platform. Um, the 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 Maui cell is that we will have a single project single code base. Currently, we still have project heads, uh, but that might go away in Maui. So now it becomes very, very easy for you to do file new project and target mobile, desktop, uh, as and and any other native uh, 
platform. So I want to say they have Tizen support. Uh, they have uh, watch OS support, TV OS support, um, just to name a few Samsung TV support, just to name a few things. So we've, uh, we've made it to Maui. Um, aloha and goodbye. And now if there are any questions, I can draft those questions now. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I learned a couple of things, especially that I should be looking more into reactive. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, if you're watching, uh, please ask them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll, ping, we'll, we'll hand them over to Rodney. Uh, let's start with this one from Trevor. Um, he has a UWP project with UWP XAML. Is there an easy way to convert it into Xamarin XAML? Um, there is not an easy way to convert it to Xamarin XAML. That's going to be a very, uh, a very manual process right now. With some of the new C Sharp source or source generators, there may be some opportunity. And and you saw my slide earlier about uh, uh, there's no tool that takes uh, design and, and creates XAML. There's going to be a very real opportunity for someone to create a a XAML generation tool uh, in the coming months because nothing like that currently exists. Uh, so in UWP and WPF, I believe you have like dependency properties um, and some of the standard syntax is different. So it's it's really going to be a a manual process, but there is the ability for you to create uh, an, a Xamarin uh, cross-platform application and then just target the UWP as a head. So if you need any help uh, uh, figuring that out, you can find me on, on the interwebs and uh, I can hopefully steer you in the right direction. Cool, makes sense. Uh, another question from John, uh, which is, is there any way to unit test the XAML code behind? No, so that is that is the, uh, the kicker, yes. Everything in the XAML code behind is technically untestable. Uh, you can test the seam of the command, uh, but you cannot, it's, it's very hard to send in an event and verify that the event does the thing. You can test the result of the event happening, but not that the actual event happened. All right, and uh, in your view model, if you have the uh, the RX pipeline of events and responding to events, is, is the RX pipeline easy to test? Yes, the, the RX pipeline is inherently easy to test. Um, observables are testable. Um, the reactive command by its by its nature is testable. So um, I didn't show it here, but uh, unit testing is is uh, one of my closet passions, and I am very much about testing the state changes because you know we're we're inverting the control logic, and we're now responsible for managing that state. So we want to make sure that when the state changes, that my my view model is actually responding accordingly. So all of that is testable. Yes. All right, makes sense. Uh, another one that just came in from Anton, uh, which is, are there any plans or do you know if there are any plans to integrate Maui with uh, Blazor so that you could uh, essentially write a universal mobile and web application? So as I understand it now, and I'm not a Maui expert, I'm trying to, uh, to become more versed as the months creep closer to the preview. But as I understand it, uh, you can use Blazor mobile bindings for that. So you can use Blazor mobile bindings for getting Blazor into Xamarin. Now, specifically, like if I want to create a Blazor target with a Xamarin target, that is achievable. Um, and this code base that I have is actually, um, th that is that will be available after the talk, uh, is actually structured in a way that will allow me to get multiple platform targets. So the, the potential ask for this sample is that it does uh, WPF, UWP, Avalonia UI, Uno UI, and Blazor all from a single application. So when this sample is complete, it will uh, it will show you very distinctly how to do that. That does sound super interesting. Especially, especially that's the you cell. Do, that's the, the promise you of more than the, than the seventy percent or uh, yeah of shared codes. Well, right, because now I can write my my view model, my business, my my mutable state is encapsulated, and now I can target any any platform that dart that dot net uh, targets so i can reach people on the web on tvos on watch os all from a single repository code base that is super cool yeah, we're, yeah. there was actually a question earlier on uh, google glass as well 
Uh, I don't believe that it supports that currently, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that they want to support uh, in the future. They currently have uh, the the new Duo dual screen windows is supported, um, and Google support is usually something that that, that happens uh, pretty expeditiously. So I, I would assume that uh, if it's possible, it will be coming. All right. Uh, then another question that just came in, uh, are there any good resources that you know of to learn more about the MVU pattern? Um, do you have anything that you can recommend there? Uh, so honestly, I would recommend going and checking out Flutter and Flutter's documentation. While it doesn't translate and correlate one-to-one -to, -one to the .NET space, i.e. their implementation details are different, mm -hmm. the concept is the same. And they are actually kind of the driver behind, I, at least I have to believe in my mind, that they're the driver behind why MVU is becoming uh, a real thing in .NET is because Flutter is having such success with it. So I would definitely go check out the Flutter docs. Um, and there's a, there's a series of videos that uh, the Flutter folks have done on MVU and streams and, e and events um, and event looping that would, that would be very beneficial for anyone trying to understand MVU. All right. <clears throat> Another one, um, which is yeah, probably not something that, that you essentially can answer, but uh, maybe you do know this. Do you know if WinUI and MAUI will be coexisting in the future? So coexisting from a living in the same repository perspective, I don't believe so. I think that those are going to be separate concerns. And you're right, Martin, I don't know the answer, but I will speculate based on what I believe I know at the moment. Uh, the trend that I see with Microsoft is they are trying to create a UI kit that works on every, that, that, that can work on any given uh, platform. So my thought would be that you would be able to create a WinUI target as well as a WPF or UWP or iOS or Android target in the future. Um, and, and some of that is actually documented on the, on the .NET 5, uh, how they're changing the target framework monikers. In the future, what you're going to do is you're going to do .NET 5.0 dash iOS or dash WinUI uh, to, to, to get the target framework moniker that you want. So my assumption is going to be that you will be able to run WinUI, Xamarin, and Blazor side by side from a single view model in the future. That's again, very, very promising. That's extremely promising. <clears throat> I, I should switch from doing more web development to, to also work on, uh, on the actual platforms. Well, you know, Blazor will allow you to get there even faster, right? Like if you understand how to do Blazor, you can, you can jump in with the Blazor mobile bindings and be up and running really quickly. Cool. All right. Um, I think that's pretty much it. There's a couple of technical questions, but I believe that uh, yeah, you will put up the, the sample code on GitHub afterwards. So I guess people can uh, can then look into that and find the answer there. Yeah, and if anybody has any technical questions that they want answered again, I'm in the RxUI Slack. I'm available on the interwebs. I, I try to be approachable, um, you know, unless I haven't had my morning cup of coffee. So reach out and let's talk. Let's become better developers together. Let's, let's push .NET to be a better platform for all of us. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, again, everyone, thank you for, uh, for watching and joining us today. Rodney, awesome presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll quickly skip to my screen as well uh, to give you a little bit more resources. If you want to learn more about Rider, we have our website, we have Twitter. Uh, this recording, as well as lots of other videos and tutorials are available on JetBrains TV. We also have a blog where we have lots of tips. Uh, in fact, I think uh, my colleague Khalid has been working on some Xamarin samples as well that will show up there uh, in the near future. And do follow Rodney on Twitter because he's doing awesome uh, stuff on there as well. Again, thank you for joining. Uh, watch the recording on JetBrains TV and look at everything else that is there. Thanks again.